Welcome to newsletter number three. I've called this one Manners and Misattributions. And it follows on really from newsletter number one. And it's a little hobby horse I've been on lately. And I can promise this might be the last time for a while I mention this. It's just something that's been coming up in the feeds lately and so on. And today I'm going to tell a little story, which I don't think has been told in full from what I can tell out there online before. So look forward to that eventually when we get there. Once again, apologies for the length. I can only try to assure you that next time, the next newsletter will be much, much shorter than any of these first three ones. And in particular, this one, which is a bit long. Now in newsletter number one, I was saying that the traditional university system is facing challenges, so to speak, not least from high quality online education and various other new institutions springing up who might be, shall we say, stealing away some of the best and brightest from some of the old sandstone and Ivy League tertiary centres of learning. There might become a time where university really becomes the place you go when you have no other options. It could end up being a second-rate place. Now, I say this as a person who loved the university experience, who aspired to spend a lot of time at university. But if I was 17 years old now, just coming out of high school, would I aspire to the university? Or would I have commenced a YouTube channel, a podcast and a blog while still in school and then searched for other ways to learn what I learned? Would I have perhaps entrepreneurs or startups or some other learning institutions offering to pay me to study rather than the other way around? It seems to be moving in that way. Now, I don't imagine this evolution will be easy, especially if there comes something like a phase change moment which in political science terms we might call a revolution of sorts. And I don't think revolutions are very good, but an avalanche starts with small stones. We know this. And I have spoken to people already who are turned off university, and yet they're fully capable of university as young people. And there are those stories becoming increasingly more frequent of those who spend a year or two in the university and then go off and do something else. Something is happening. Now, of course, this has always happened. You know, people drop out of university. But to be a dropout used to be pejorative. Now it's like, oh, wow, what better offer did you get kind of thing? We know that many of the backstories of the tech wizards avoided uni altogether. Or they got out quick once they found the problem with which they fell in love. Until now, they have been the exception. But might they one day be the rule? I don't know. The universities have long now been heavily politicised, but this is not that problem. That only makes things worse. Their underlying problem is the failure to adapt more quickly to the market. I think there must always be a role for universities. I'm optimistic about that. But it might be in the form more of research institutions rather than teaching, especially teaching undergraduates. Maybe that kind of learning can always be better done elsewhere. Maybe you only need a university to learn from when you're a postgraduate and you need that more one-on-one -on -one attention with the world's greatest expert in a particular area. I don't know. We're not quite there yet and the university system is, of course, highly profitable. But that's because there is an unending stream of students. All one needs to do in the university finance department is ensure that the standard or the requirements for entry are broad enough as to allow, well, in the limit, anyone at all to attend so long as they can pay the fees. If that's your standard, you can be a viable business for a long time, I imagine, diluting your credential along the way, which some people won't care about for a long time. And by the way, diluting the credentials of everyone else who has that particular certificate, it's a form of inflation, really, isn't it? But I can also imagine that if this happens, there will be teachers, parents, professors, and politicians ready to pour scorn on the young intellects who eschew formal university education. They will complain they, the ones who have not been to university, have not been properly enculturated or socialised. They lack the good manners of broader society and so on. And that's my topic here today once more. Manners. Manners in the year 2022. And in preparing this here and now, as with newsletter one, I wanted to refer to this quote. I've often used it before, and it's attributed to Socrates, and I've attributed it to Socrates before as well. It goes like this, quote from Socrates, Our youth now love luxury. 
They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders and love chatter in place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up their food and tyrannize their teachers. End quote. And I found that quote attributed to Socrates as written by Aristophanes, apparently. So two and a half thousand years ago, as I've often quoted this, I will often say something after it, like, so for two and a half thousand years, the same sort of things have been said over and over again. People have this tendency to run down their own youth in society. It's a great quote. It sounds great. Echoing through the millennia. And it makes that perfect point. Millennia ago, adults had the same attitude towards the youth as they do today. Not much has changed. That may well be true, but the quote, I have to tell you, and some may already know, is a complete misattribution. Well, at best, it's a misattribution. It's a fabrication at worst. It took a little effort to get to the heart of the matter. There are some sites out there that do actually tell you it's a misattribution, but they don't tell you the complete story. They tell you where it came from, but I want to tell you a little bit more about the source of this quote and the fact that the quote still actually can kind of be used and carry the same meaning. As far as I can tell, there's no other source out there right here and now, other than me talking to you right now, that offers a more complete story about this quote, the origins of this quote. So here it is. The quote is made up, but it comes in a form from an obscure book on the schooling system of ancient Greece by a Kenneth John Freeman. Kenneth John Freeman was a student at Cambridge University in their Bachelor of Arts program at the beginning of last century, so early 1900s. Upon graduation, he wanted to take up a fellowship at Trinity College, and to gain that position, he needed to produce, quote, some original work, end quote. So that means an essay. He wrote an essay on the topic of ancient Greek education. But sadly, Mr. Kenneth Freeman died in 1906, and that was just three months before he might have taken up his position at Trinity Now, whether it was the case that the academics at Trinity were so very impressed by his work, or just reasonably well impressed, but moved by how tragic his early death was, I don't know. But whatever the case, his essay was, rather remarkably one would presume, turned into a book by them, the academics at Trinity, and published by the publishing house Macmillan & Co, no less, in 1907. At the beginning of the book, there is an editor's statement that begins, quote, It has fallen to my lot to edit this essay, end quote, which seems rather like it was a task among many on that editor's desk that he was not entirely enthused about. Either that or it's just a sign of the times, which I guess it was, just a manner of speaking and writing as the editor does go on to praise Mr. Freeman, listing a remarkable catalogue of academic achievements given his short life. So it seems he, the late Mr. Freeman, really was very highly regarded as a scholar. A reason I am bothering with any of this is that Kenneth John Freeman did indeed have very high standards of scholarship and wrote himself on the topic of studying ancient texts, though I found it would apply to any book at all. Let me read you an interesting quote from in the book. He says, quote, I have confined my attention very largely for several years to original texts and eschewed the aid of commentaries. As to accepted interpretations, I have, purposely and on principle, neither read nor heard much of them since I wished in pursuance of the bidding of Plato himself not to receive unquestioningly the authority of those whom to herd is to believe, but to develop views and interpretations of my own. For I have always believed that education suffers immensely from the study of books about books in preference to the study of the books themselves. End quote from Mr. Kenneth Freeman. Now that, to me, is a remarkable thing. So it is all the more a travesty that one of his very own quotes is misattributed. Yes, indeed, that quote I've quoted so often, apparently, from Socrates, is, as I say, from the work of Kenneth John Freeman. But he didn't quite write it. So we'll get to there. But before we do, I just want to linger on what Mr. Freeman says right there. I can't agree more. When it comes to subjects we know, it's so often the case that the commentators get things wrong. 
Journalists always seem to make errors in areas where we ourselves claim some degree of expertise or knowledge. And as I say, so imagine how well they are faring in all those other areas where we do not know as much. No better, of course. Whenever I read some other philosopher's reflections on the work of Popper, I am now unsurprised to read a completely mangled misinterpretation. I think this is a function of an error both of fans and foes of Popper alike, by the way. They want to say what he really meant, and usually without quoting him broadly enough. They'll take things out of context or not realise he clarified things in later writings that in earlier writings he did not quite express as he wanted to later on. Often, it all comes down to about what Popper actually meant or actually thought about, let's say, falsification. And the commentator will say this or that, which is entirely inconsistent when you read the man in his own words in the context of some entire chapter of a particular book. It's why I strive, I hope, when I speak about the work of either David Deutsch or Karl Popper or anyone else, I continue to go to some length to say, these are my words. I am not speaking for these people. When I quote them, I will quote them. I will say that so-and-so said. Otherwise, errors are entirely my own. But academic critiques usually aren't of that kind, especially in philosophy. You read some philosopher holding some important chair at some prestigious Ivy League institution, and they say something like, well, Popper was a naive falsificationist. And well, that's that. You rarely get quotes, and rarely does anyone ever bother with trying to explain what conjectural knowledge is, an epistemology that denies the possibility of strictly logical falsification of that naive kind. But never mind that, because you're claiming to represent the mind of someone else. And even fans of Popper, for example, get caught up in debates about what he really meant by what he wrote. They go down this justificationist and essentialist path. Better to my mind just to explain your own thoughts and reflections on the matter at hand and then take responsibility for just what you say without playing the he said, she said game. I like to think that I'm explaining a philosophy or a worldview or a theory, scientific or otherwise. It doesn't matter actually what David Deutsch himself said or Karl Popper actually said, unless of course you're quoting them and saying, this is what they said, in which case you better get it right, in context. There is epistemology and there is physics and it doesn't matter what Popper, Deutsch, Einstein, Socrates or Feynman or anyone else said, because there is not Einstein's physics strictly. There is physics, and there is not Popper's epistemology. There is epistemology. And it's not clear to me that Popper always was the most clear when it comes to explaining some of this, because like any genius who gets to some place first, he's got the most muck and mud and nonsense to clear out of the way before making a path through for the rest of us, who then have a much easier time seeing the road ahead. So it's not Popper's fault he wasn't always clear. You try being the first person to figure out a precise epistemology that describes conjectural knowledge in detail when everyone around you is a Platonist dogmatically committed to justified true belief. <laughs> so anyways, we should be careful when we are saying Popper meant so-and-so. Not merely to quote him, but to quote some substantial part of what he said in context and provide the context. And even then... It might all be pointless, because what we're actually interested in are the ideas, not who said what. And all of that is on a continuum with this here and now, a fabrication and a misattribution. What appears in Mr. Freeman's book, which is titled, by the way, Schools of Hellas, with the subtitle, An Essay on the Practice and Theory of Ancient Greek Education, is something very close to the quotation that gets passed around and wrongly attributed to Socrates. Now, I have not, as of yet, read the entire book, School of Hellas, but I did spend a couple of days carefully reading the first two chapters in order to locate, amongst other things, the exact quote and determine its complete context. I do think the book, for its age and for the manner in which it was published and came to publication, is very impressive and interesting work because, well, how interesting is it to learn about this whole subject? School in ancient Greece. Freeman actually has a wonderfully evocative way of writing. In the introduction, he says that Hellas, ancient Greece in other words, was basically the teacher of nations, and therefore that a study of how the teacher of nations taught her own sons and daughters could be informative. And in so wondering about how this teacher of nations taught its own, he wonders, are there lessons for the modern world? He asks the reader to consider this. 
as I say, the book was published in 1907, so by any metric I can find, it's completely out of copyright. In Australia, copyright on books is about 75 years, and in the US it's about 95 years, and in the UK there's something more complicated going on, but the longest duration I could find is 70 years after the death of the last surviving author. So in this case, the author died in 1906, so for all the places that matter to me, <laughs> for the purposes of this, we can provide the book online. So it's there on my website, I'll provide the link in the description here, or in the article if you're reading it, and it's there as a PDF. Or you can search my site for School of Hellas. If someone in authority or with expert knowledge contacts me to say, remove that link and that PDF or else we'll take you to court, and they've got a good reason, then I'll do it. But until then, I think I've got the law right. If it's not there, then you'll know what happened. Anyways, let's get to the meat of the matter. If we go to page 71, which is in chapter 2, Freeman writes about how as Athens began to mature, there was what he called a period of juvenile emancipation. So the children no longer had to till the fields and work quite so hard as they had. They were expected to go to school and study. That was the worst of it. And they experienced, quote, luxury and indulgence, end quote, in the closing decades of the 5th century BC. This, Freeman said, caused, quote, conservative thinkers to look back with longing and no doubt idealizing eyes to the good old times, end quote. He goes on to say, quote, the 6th and early 5th centuries came, probably unjustly, to be regarded as the ideal age of education, when children learned obedience and morality, and were not pampered and depraved, when they were beautiful and healthy, not pale-faced, stunted and over-educated, end quote. Freeman goes through a number of people, including quotes from Aristophanes, who pines for the times when children were seen and not heard. Indeed, for three or four pages, Freeman speaks about ancient Greeks pining for the good old days when children were better behaved when compared with the present-day young boys who cavorted with ballet girls and flute girls, both of whom seem to be disreputable types. Plato gets a mention, of course, because he complains that students are not sufficiently afraid of their schoolmasters, and instead the teacher flatters their students. And finally, on page 74, in chapter 2, we come to it, where Freeman writes, and I quote, quote, The counts of the indictment are luxury, bad manners, contempt for authority, disrespect to elders, and a love for chatter in place of exercise. He goes on to claim that children began to be the tyrants, not the slaves of their households. They no longer rose from their seats when an elder entered the room. They contradicted their parents, chatted before company, gobbled up the dainties at the table and committed various offences against Hellenic tastes such as crossing their legs, end quote. And there it is. That's the quote by Freeman. Freeman himself summarizing what he read, not by attributing to a single author, but rather he was collecting together an anonymous conglomeration of ancient writers. He's pulled it all together there and summarized what they've all said. So it wasn't Socrates. It was a whole bunch of people who lived back then around Socrates' time or just before. And he continues to write lots more in this vein. So the spirit of the quote is quite right. So the point can still be made that, yes, even two and a half thousand years ago, we have textual evidence that people in that enlightened society were speaking of teenagers, of the youth as being, you know, ill-mannered and so on and so forth. It just wasn't Socrates, which makes no difference to the fact. Little has changed, it seems, in two and a half thousand years, the way in which adults talk about the people who are becoming adults. So it was that specific paragraph that I just read that was taken and wrongly attributed to Socrates himself. And worse, it was embellished and fabricated in part. So the original simply doesn't exist and is instead a bastardization of the words of Freeman himself when summarizing what he was taking away from reading these ancient texts, which complained in various places about the youth. As I say, the important thing to notice here is the point stands, the substance is accurate, and so it is true that these attitudes towards children remain today. And the kids today are the same as they essentially always have been in enlightened societies. And the reaction of elders towards them, similarly predictable in retrospect. Now, I'll end on all this with a related observation, which is why I wanted to use the quote in the first place about committing offences against taste. In other words, being rude. I think there's a place for courtesy. I really do, especially in academia, because I think it's a matter of efficiency and progress. Rudeness is inefficient. And it's not the first time I've said that, but I noticed 
just a couple of days ago that a navalism cropped up in my feed, uh, a quote from Naval Ravikant. And Naval said at one point, quote, unhappiness is inefficient, end quote, which is very much in tune with my sentiments. Unhappiness, rudeness, it just gets in the way of getting things done. If you want to solve the problem, then be happy, be energetic and be polite so that all involved get along and you're not quickly sidetracked because someone gets their nose out of joint about how you're behaving. But surely that's their problem, you might think. Well, not anymore it's not. Now it's your problem because you have to deal with it if you want to work this thing out. And I'm seeing this in academia as expressed online increasingly. If two people have different views and we suspect that one of them might have something closer to the truth, it's good if they can put their cases quickly and efficiently and nut it out, so to speak, have the encounter and see where the truth is. Sadly, though, these days, especially with social media, one side begins to put the case, but puts the case so terribly, so rudely, so discourteously, the other person comes back in the same way or simply never engages at all. And possibly quite rightly, they never engage as well. Who wants to experience the personal unpleasantness of insults? Even if they do engage, it won't be on substance, but it'll be on style. And, the, and so the original topic gets derailed into competing claims about professionalism and so on. I see this in, once again, astrophysics rather often. But you see it everywhere, and it means there exist out there on social media monologues where there should be dialogues. There are takedowns and destroyeds where there should be collegial discussion of the details. I'll just end this with an example. I wouldn't normally personalise things, but as I'm quoting, I have to mention some names here. Like so many others interested in science, I find some of what the most famous astrophysicist on Earth at this moment, Neil deGrasse Tyson, has to say, at times fascinating and very good for the culture of science. At other times, I find it wrong and misguided or filled with misconception. Very well. But I hope I've always tried to focus on the ideas. I don't think Neil is a crank or an ignoramus. I think perhaps, like anyone who gets to that level of fame, he might sometimes find it difficult to sift the good and worthwhile signal of valid criticism from the noise of critical insults. Whatever the case, I just do not understand the point of an overtly hostile tone. For example, I found this article, a blog post really, from a historian of science, admittedly not an astrophysicist, not a mathematician apparently. Links in the description. Perhaps this particular historian does wonderful work. I don't know. But I'm disinclined to read anything else he has written just because, well, it's a put-off to read that Dr. Tyson, quote, knows nothing and, quote, is spouting total crap and, quote, he's supposedly intelligent. And to top it all off, apparently doing what he does, quote, he's just doing it for the money, end quote. <sighs> I just do not understand parts of modern academic culture, or perhaps some modern academics. Like I admit, I have a public-facing top cast appearance, and then I have a way in which I am with my friends when we hang out, and perhaps one tends not to use language that's quite so formal in those situations. I would be an absolute pain in the neck if I was this guy 24-7. So I'm not. I don't think I'm being dishonest in switching between mildly different versions of public and private personas. I think I'm doing what a human being does, adapting to situations as needed. It's why we have the phrase, behind closed doors. And so I think an academic engaging another academic, and yes, even on a personal blog, if it's going to be out there in public, should at least have some minimal level of courtesy. And not least because it's more efficient. That's professionalism. I admit Neil Tyson gets stuff wrong. I can agree with this historian of science who wrote about him on every factual matter. A minor issue, though it is. So why is getting his nose so terribly out of joint on such a small issue? I do not know. But it all comes off as, what we say in Australia, tall poppy syndrome. In other words, the historian just seems to me to be upset that Neil Tyson has great fame and success and so holds him to a very different standard. A standard that says he's fair game for being insulted which is a strange standard when you think about it. The more successful you become, the more valid it is to insult you. I think the heuristic of writing as if your mother or your partner, or in this case, the subject you're writing about, is reading along is a reasonable heuristic. But academic culture is rapidly becoming what journalistic culture became some decades ago, politicised and then 
downright hostile to anyone who fails to meet the moral standards set by your side. I know what it does, what effect it has, because I hear it. I hear it from young people. It very much fails to impress the youth. They get enough of that in their own social groups, the sniping and the pettiness. Well, in fact, they probably get less of it at times. Many of the kids today who aspire to an intellectual life or a life in academia are already in mature social groups that navigate disagreement well. So what is sometimes on display between dueling PhDs, or sometimes not dueling, sometimes, as I say, the monologue tirade from one intellect all about another, is a real turnoff. As I say, the article I provide a link to of that historian talking about Tyson is just an example, but it speaks to a broader phenomenon I write about in my blog post, Astronomical Disdain. My appeal is for perhaps just a little more good-humoured courtesy to be shown when some disagreement arises, even if that disagreement is for another scientist, or a celebrity, or a celebrity scientist, or a billionaire, or a celebrity billionaire. We have to expect that people are fallible, no matter how famous or wealthy they are. And error is the natural state of things in the world, so what logically follows is that people will disagree. If academia and the intelligentsia is going to be anything to the rest of culture, shouldn't it be an example of how to navigate disagreement? If the ladies and gentlemen, and what does Disney apparently say now? Dreamers of all ages. If the dreamers of all ages of academia and the expert class cannot show, well, let's say, some class, then what hope is there for the rest of civilization? Well, perhaps quite a bit. It could just be a generational thing. The Gen Y and Gen Z academics might be putting on a bit of a show, but it could be enough to show the Zoomers, those who are still in high school or about to leave high school, how not to behave online. Perhaps, perhaps not. If it's acceptable for Academy Award winners to commit violence live on camera against comedians telling jokes and then get a standing ovation, perhaps the tolerance for unpleasantness in social situations is high enough now that we should expect our highly qualified doctors and professors to be slinging insults at each other. Perhaps it's always been so. There was that poker incident, after all, between Popper and Wittgenstein. But even if it has been this way, there should be something better to aspire to. Before I finish up, this one has again once more been released into my usual feed, but it will be the last of these newsletters that is released into my podcast feed or put onto my YouTube channel. The rest will be much shorter, I do promise. So if you're hearing this in the podcast feed or watching on YouTube, note the link for signing up in the description to this video or podcast for my newsletter. As I said last time as well, I'd rather everything I create, or almost everything, to remain entirely free and available to everyone. And the reasons are that the people I admire most have always done this. There's a long tradition of this in knowledge creation, especially science, of just putting your stuff out there for free. And most of what I talk about here is at least in part influenced by other people. And a lot of the original ideas don't originate with me, but with them. So it would seem strange to charge for ideas, not my own. And of course, most importantly, I think out of all of these, the work I do in spreading any of these ideas of optimism and the worldview of David Deutsch, Karl Popper, Richard Feynman and so on, the ideas around physics and philosophy, I want them to spread as far as possible. So putting no barriers like cost in front of that is really important. All of that said, I do accept donations for the same reason anyone accepts any payment ever. One's got bills to pay and might need to upgrade their technology at times so I can continue to have some fancy visuals in some of my videos. So I do have a means of donation for those who'd like to support me. Go to www bretthall.org and there on the front page are links to Patreon and PayPal and I should let you know that for those who do contribute I've been happy to engage with people one-on-one -on -one over the last few months in asynchronous voice messaging that seems to work really well my supporters are small in number which makes that kind of thing feasible for the time being until next time bye-bye <laughs>